that actually has been a major challenge in the Emerge Network is, is trying to integrate the, uh, the ophthalmologist notes, so we're, uh, we're continuing to work on that. Um, so again, let me add my, my thanks and recognition to the incredible amount of work that, that people have done in the past two days and actually in the several uh, weeks preceding this meeting. This is, it was incredibly helpful and especially to get such a large number of, of international experts on this uh, particular horrible syndrome uh, in the same room uh, addressing this has been, been really um, uh, very uh, uh, useful for us. So, so I thought I would start out by identifying sort of some of the questions that we, we had hit on that were sort of neat to, uh, to consider and, and things that really hadn't been addressed about this condition. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the innovative approaches that, uh, that were proposed. Uh, I think something that we really would like to come away from this is a consensus amongst us as to the highest priority research needs, and that's why I kept asking that question. Um, we have a, a series of, of research needs identified by the working groups. I won't go through those. Um, those were, were very useful, and we'll put those together in a, uh, a summary of the, of the meeting um, and can, can kind of go back to you and say, you know, what order might you put these in? But really, we're, we're not ever going to have you all a, a, you know, together again in the same room to be able to address this. So, so let's really try, if we can, to, to see if we can, we can come up with those. But just to sort of start with uh, intriguing questions, so I think um, uh, one of them was, you know, we, we sort of started off with this, this question of nomenclature. It, it really didn't come up very much at all in the rest of the meeting, which surprised me because it's, it's sort of throughout the, the literature, uh, although uh, Jay and, and uh, Maya raised it a little bit uh, uh, this morning. But, but is there some way that we could develop a molecular taxonomy um, of, of these conditions that would provide for, for better characterization and agreement on what it is. Then there were a series of questions early on about why is there so much variation in the presentation, in the course, in the histology, et cetera, such as you know, uh, the degree of inflammation histopathologically. Why is the skin reaction so patchy when many other skin um, uh, uh, reactions, particularly to drugs, uh, uh, tend to be much more generalized? Um, uh, what's unique about the, the stratified squamous epithelium? Um, why is it, it, it really sort of stop at the, at, you know, the border of, of that? And, and what is it about that, uh, that particular tissue that, uh, that makes it susceptible? Um, something that came up also in, in terms of less the diversity than the commonalities, why are the same HLA alleles implicated over and over again? What is, you know, um, unique or common in, the, in their structure that, that makes them more likely to cause this, this reaction? Um, I'm sure that there's research in that area going on. It, it didn't seem to come up as a, as a topic, or maybe I just missed where it would fit in from the basic research group, but it, it seems to be something that you, that you might want to consider, and, and again, we can talk about it in the, in the research uh, uh, directions. Um, and then um, what can be learned from ethnic-specific associations? I think repeatedly we've heard mentioned uh, Meniere's data on the, uh, on the Italians and why they're, uh, why they're driving that particular association. That's probably only one of many such um, findings, and, and we'd, we'd like to understand it better. Uh, other intriguing questions, what the, what's the impact of rare variation in, in the HLA locus? So even though there are a number of common alleles, there's also um, obviously lots of rare, rare variation. How do we assess that? Can we use burden tests, et cetera? Um, again, repeatedly, why do such a small minority of, of people who actually, for, for some drugs, for other drugs, it's not always such a small minority. Um, but why are many of the carriers, you know, not affected and can take these drugs with, with impunity? And what is it, what are the cofactors that might um, um, produce this? Um, are, are drugs recognized the same ways as, as viral antigens? Or, or are there differences in the way um, uh, these are approached? And, and probably a, a question that all of us were, were wondering, should Steve Leader become a U.S. citizen? <laughs> Steve, are you serious? Serious. I mean, give up your, you know. Oh, now or that that card is out of the barn. It's out of the barn. I already passed the exam. You did. Oh, congratulations! And you, and you've already lost your health insurance, right? <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, in, in terms of, of innovative studies that we, we might do, um, uh, the, the, uh, can we look back in the drug trials that were halted because SJS10 uh, developed? And, and you know, was DNA stored from those, and could that be looked into? Many of those are industry-sponsored trials, but couldn't we work with industry in some way to be able to, to get access to those? Um, a point that was made, I, I think, a couple of times that, that uh, oftentimes we don't appreciate is that negative predictive value can be as helpful as positive predictive value. And, and there are times where the FDA will not say, you know, this never causes such and such. You, you do, I think, often say uh, it's not been reported or it's not commonly associated or, or that kind of thing. So, so even, even their um, uh, negative studies would be, would be uh, useful. Um, one 
really needs to sort of step backward from the identified risk allele to understand the immunopathogenesis. And I think um, many of the things that were recommended by the basic science group uh, get at that. Um, move more toward an in vitro uh, preclinical testing of drugs. Um, and, and the point was made that if, if we get to the point where we have to do case control studies, in a sense, we've failed. You know, we, we've let a drug get out into the, into the uh, population that causes this. And, and shouldn't there be a way that we can pick that up before? Um, and then, uh, as, as was mentioned a couple of times here, surveillance or research in burn units and working with the burn association since they see so many of these patients. Um, also, we heard this morning about HLA expression levels. What, you know, what an interesting idea. And, and is there some way we could use that, perhaps, to distinguish between the people who develop, who carry the risk allele, and you know, maybe they're not expressing it, maybe there's something else about them. Um, and study the, the uh, as I said, the risk allele carriers who don't get the disease. Some of the real challenges we identified were difficulties in, in early diagnosis, uh, the, the fact that these, these patients often go for, for several days or longer, um, sometimes moving from uh, hospital to hospital before they're, they're actually definitively diagnosed and treated, a lack of systematic reporting. Is there some way to mandate that or at least to strongly encourage it and the potential maybe to work with patient advocacy groups to encourage that to happen or the CDC or others? Uh, we talked about how practitioner education was, was critical, but it might not suffice. And I think, uh, especially this morning, uh, we, we heard from Cynthia in Singapore that, yes, it was useful to send out a, a newsletter to, to doctors, at least that let them know that this con uh, condition existed. But that didn't change anything until their Ministry of Health mandated it as, as something that was standard of care. Did I quote you correctly, Cynthia? Yes. Um, the importance of balancing individual utility against societal impact in societies where individuals can actually, you know, go out and get these tests and, and find a way of get, getting that information used. Um, you know, is that something that, uh, that should be at least facilitated, if not, if not encouraged? Um, and then the need to balance that against societal impact, recognizing that really we as a society, particularly as Howard pointed out, you know, these are iatrogenic diseases. And if we cause them, you know, we need to do, do something about them and, and take responsibility for doing that. Um, the point was made that animal models really are lacking, but even if we had them, they, you know, it's not clear how useful they would be because of the, uh, the differences in the way they, they process antigens. Um, but maybe they could be used for testing pathways. Um, and, and really even a, a basic definition of a landscape, certainly in the U.S., where we, we just don't know the burden of this problem. And then some opportunities, and, and we heard a couple of times how we're just, just or uh, Mark just recently mentioned, uh, comparing and harmonizing case report forms across the multiple um, uh, networks that are doing this kind of work. We already have these forms. There's no reason to develop another. There's certainly no reason for another, you know, for a hospital to develop another. Uh, and trying to find some way to, to bring those together and, and agree upon them would be very useful. Uh, working with patient advocates, as I mentioned, to encourage adoption of reporting. Um, uh, Mark Avigan suggested, you know, is there some way to capture research reports, uh, not research reports, but the, uh, the case reports that are being collected it's in some of these hospital systems, like the Cerner system we heard about earlier, uh, and send those directly to the FDA electronically. And, that's, and it sounds like that's something you can now accept, um, which would be fabulous to, to get those to you. So can we figure out a way to make that link happen? Um, and uh, and the, the point being made that, uh, that, you know, why not get our HLA typing done now uh, before we become organ donors um, and, and we can use it for ourselves as well as uh, uh, for the, the people who eventually use our organs. So um, these were a number of high priority research needs that were identified yesterday. Again, I won't, I won't go through them because many of them were picked up by the working groups. But we'll have these slides. We'll put them on, the, um, on our website, and, and so you'll, you'll at least have them available. Um, but I really wanted to spend most of our time here. So, so can we come to consensus as to what we see as being the, the highest priority research needs, recognizing that you know, we can propose something really, really big and, and overarching in that, and maybe that will happen maybe many years from now, and maybe there are things that are a little bit smaller, a little more constrained that, that could be pursued um, uh, earlier on that might facilitate uh, some of these. So um, collecting good biosamples early in the course uh, was, I think, recognized as a, as a key issue for um, uh, early diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers. Um, that's not something likely that the burn units, correct me if I'm wrong, you clinicians who treat this, but, but most of the patients, by the time they end up in the burn unit, it's not early in their course. Is that a fair statement, Neil? That it's not, yeah, so you need to get them before then. So how, how might we go about doing that? Does everyone agree that this is a, a high priority need? Is there any disagreement to that one, I guess? 
great. And these are not in priority order, they're sort of in, in temporal order. Um, and then we, I, I think everybody sort of, sort of crystallized around this idea of a large scale international network for collecting biosamples, harmonized phenotyping, it actually would address a whole bunch of the, of the research needs. But this is gonna be very challenging to do. And, and I'm, I'm not totally optimistic that it's gonna happen tomorrow. Um, I don't know that it, it would happen even, even after tomorrow. Um, but, but would the group agree that, that this is, is one that, you know, if we could do it, it, it would be probably the most important thing we could do? That's what I heard. Does anybody want to say anything else about this? Uh, so Jay, very briefly, and, uh, and then Mark. Yeah, that's very, very nice. I, I would encourage you, in this type of thing, you should include what we call a retrospective study, too, so everybody calls their patients that have survived and a year or two ago, because you can use that for DNA testing. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be the sole reason, but it will enrich your your numbers uh, quite a bit. And you can do research with, you know, the drugs that did it then versus now and so forth. And it's it's fairly simple. W one type of problem that we run into is the consent form. And if you have a lot of centers, it's it's terrible burden on everyone. And this is where we really need this idea of a centralized consent form. Okay, NIH approved, approved by your institute, several institutes. No, ex excellent. Other institutes yeah. should, should accept it. And so now in your, your RFAs that you go out with, you can say, you have to agree that you will accept a central consent yeah, no, that's, form. That's, that's a really a big problem, a very big problem. Okay, thanks. It also, so if you're sitting in uh, Toronto and you heard of a case in Edmonton, you could send the consent form to someone in Edmonton and say, get, get the blood from this guy, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Great idea. Okay, thank you. <laughs> was uh, the comment about um, developing a way to deposit this information, ClinVar or something similar to that. I don't uh, know that that's necessarily captured in that bullet, but I think that would be something that could, in fact, be turned on more quickly than building something. Mm -hmm. No, excellent point. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, Sam. So I just want to add something to Jay's comment about the centralized um, IRB consent form. So we are working with the centralized consent forms, but I just want everyone to be aware that when you cross international borders, if you also want your international collaborators to use a common consent form, you might get questions about if you have my nationals data, how does that protect them? How are they impacted by our Patriot Act? So it's just things that we sitting around the table wouldn't think about, but these are things that will come up and we just need to be prepared to answer. That was from Canada and we actually did work it out, but it, was, it took us a while. Well, we can make Canada the 50 for, 51st state. Is what <laughs> That's right. uh -huh. Exactly. Hi, uh, yeah. Good. Um, so, so, all right. So, it sounds sounds like there's still a, a lot of consensus around that that recommendation. Um, we also heard from the uh, um, the pharmacosurveillance group the the race ethnic breakdown in SJS10 in the U.S., which is completely unknown as far as we could tell. We, so, we understand that the FDA had previously not been allowed to collect that information. Did I get that right? Um, and now you you may be allowed to collect it if we can provide it to you. Um, so, and th this is something that actually NIH mandates to be collected. So, so in our studies, you know, we do we do have. Um, does anyone disagree with the way that that's stated or the importance, sort of the primary importance of, of trying to I want to raise a question. Uh, several people have said that <clears throat> HLA is not restricted in animals, and I thought it was discovered in animals. HLA restriction was discovered in mice, right? So we, so we lost Mary. So they have different HLA. What? They have animals. They have, yeah, they don't have the human HLA molecule. So perhaps I could suggest this to be a good topic for after the meeting. Um, <laughs> but it would be nice to find an animal model, so maybe we could ask our veterinarians, mm -hmm. does this occur in mm -hmm. horses, cows, sheep, so Well, SGSTEN does it occur in dogs, given sulfonamides. In dogs? In dogs. Yes, Lars. To the race ethnic breakdown, wouldn't that fit in with the epidemiology that you wanted to look at better in the U.S. that would go together? Yes, yeah. No, that's an excellent point because you, you really have to have that. Uh, in order, and there's a lot of other information from the epidemiology that, uh, that we would need. Um, the standardized case definition, I think, was another that, uh, that, that seemed to be you know, pretty universally agreed upon. Uh, any disagreements with that? Okay. 
um, and then engaging the burn units in research and, and the fact that there are only five dozen or so, I didn't know that, but, uh, but that's nice. As, as Bob says, that is a very tractable, tractable model. So here's the really hard question late in the afternoon. Is there anything really, Im really critical missing from, from this list? Recognizing we'll have all the working group slides now, but I just want to be sure that you all have the chance to discuss anything that we sort of identify as being a, a crucial. Is Dave Veenstra still here, or is, am I, I can't? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think it's, it's more of a pilot project, but I do think that he brought up some good points in sort of identifying small pilot projects, both for qualitative research and also, um, you know, including stuff on patient preference and other information that was a something that would be an easy priority to start towards. Uh, I just had a question on the, on the race ethnic breakdown. I don't know if it's possible for you to also collect, um, I mean, a little bit finer granularity um, in Asians than just Asian. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so what NIH is mandated to do in its office, actually by the Office of, of Civil Rights, I believe, in the census, um, is to collect our, our five or six, you know, major ethnic groups. But, but the, um, uh, the U.S. Census actually has a, a much longer list that, that goes into the subgroups of, of uh, various ethnicities. And so, so I think it's, it's something that we could add into a research program. We wouldn't have it across all of our research programs because it's not mandated to, to do that. That's a, that's a good point, so. So including subgroups, I guess we could say. Okay. Other things that we're, that we're missing that, uh, that really should be on here? No? Cool, yeah, I think, I think we had a pretty reasonable consensus among, among, uh, around the team, which is unusual. Sometimes you have, have lots of competing uh, uh, agendas. So, uh, so then I, I think the, the question is kind of what, what are our next steps? Um, and uh, what we will be proceeding with relatively rapidly is to, is to do closed captioning, which is, you know, for the um, uh, hearing impaired um, is, is something that Alvaro does in, in record time. Uh, and it's, it's really quite an extensive effort. Um, but in the next week or so, uh, we'll have the, the webcast archived and, and up on our, our website. Um, so, so that will be done quickly. Um, we'll be drafting a meeting summary and we try to put in an, an executive summary. The, the meeting summary tends to be, you know, almost minutes of a, of a meeting, um, except we didn't have really decision and action items. Uh, and uh, and a, an executive summary that you could just, you know, point your colleagues to a page, page and a half or so of the major recommendations. Um, we're also planning to draft a white paper for a peer-reviewed publication if they'll take it. Um, and, and generally we've been fairly successful in trying to, to get these kinds of things published. If you have ideas for, um, for where, you know, what would be suitable venues for that, that would be great. Um, generally, we, we try to have these authored by the, the meeting presenters and um, uh, so the speakers and the moderators. So even though we had a larger group in the room, um, uh, probably sort of focusing it on that group, unless if there are any you know, huge objections to that, let me know and, and we can try to work something out. Um, I would say that though that we do need to hear, once we start to distribute drafts, we do need to hear from every person whose name is on the, the paper in order to, uh, that, that you would meet uh, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors uh, requirements for authorship and that you have reviewed and approved uh, uh, any, uh, anything that goes out. So we'll do that. Um, then uh, uh, considering possible research initiatives is, is something that we are constantly doing within the NIH and, and we will pursue that. Uh, but we can't say much more about it than that because that, you know, if we, if we told you much more, it's like, you know, if I told you we'd have to kill you. No, it's, uh, but, <laughs> but it's more the, the idea that, that uh, you know, if you're too closely involved in that development, then you're, you know, you kind of have a leg up in, in competition over other groups. And so you're, you're sort of precluded from competing, which would not be a good thing. So. Um, we would, we, we've heard the need to work among uh, various federal partners, and I list many of them up there. Uh, unfortunately, only two of which are, are represented at this meeting, and we recognize that was a, a, a mistake on our part. And for those of you who may be listening, we're sorry, uh, but we, we do need to engage the CDC, the, the Agency for Health Research uh, and Quality, um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, and the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, um, which is a quasi-federal uh, uh, agency, um, to try to see how we can uh, come together for some potential joint efforts in this area. 
uh, also the, the uh, facilitating the comparison and harmonization of the phenotyping and case report efforts should be something that could be done short term without tons of money and just with some, 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 ah, some volunteer effort. Uh, stimulating interest among um, uh, the home agencies and the collaborative efforts uh, would be something that, that you all can do. So I sort of color coded these here. Uh, the blue ones are the things that we will do within NHGRI. Uh, the, the yellow would be more for, for the federal partnerships. And then really sort of your name here for, for these other efforts. Uh, uh, we'd, we'd really like to see uh, amongst this group, the, those who are involved in these collaborations, can you come together? Um, can we help to facilitate that? But we really need to rely on you to actually do it, um, to, to harmonize your, your phenotyping and case report efforts. Um, and then those of you who are, are from abroad and who are going home, can you go home and stimulate some interest in your home countries among your agencies and, and you know, people that, that would have an interest in this and would want to work with us uh, in potentially um, uh, collaborating in, in some effort going forward, we don't even know what that might look like. But if we can at least hear that there is, is interest in the welcome in the MRC and in the, you know, the Thai ministry and the various ministries and that, I think that would be very helpful to us. So those were kind of the, the next steps that we're thinking of. Um, are, there, are there any that we're missing other than writing a check? Um, but, but, uh, yes, Lars. I don't know if it's missing, but I have the, there are meetings on drug eruptions where some of us meet, but several of us are at meetings of different interests in our, in our own specificities, ophthalmology, dermatology, immunology, genetics. And I think one way to get all these things moving in a regular is seeing, meeting each other regularly in a small group. And this is a, a really small group. And if we were to exchange some data, I think that would stimulate a lot of collaboration and get things going. So that's maybe something that should be considered, too. Well, that's a, what do people think of that? I, I realize that, that it's a big world and, and trying to, huh? yeah, that's right, I know, there, there are enough. Well, even, you know, we can, we can meet virtually. I mean, there, you know, we can do web meetings, which are not, you know, they're not as good, obviously, as, as meeting face-to-face, -face, but. Yes. So, so there are there are meeting grants that we can we can support. It can it becomes a challenge. There there are very strict criteria for those, and the various institutes have different uh, um, uh, approaches to how they support them. But I think something to keep in mind is is yes, you do all go to to different meetings, and we've we've spoken about particularly in SGS10 how there's a, a wide variety of practitioners prescribing these drugs. Wouldn't it be cool to maybe have a couple of slides that you could you know you take the photograph of the beautiful group of us there and say we had a, a whole group of people that came together and recognized that you know guidelines in this area are desperately needed and here are come, some of the things we think would be useful in those guidelines. When we heard from Neil, he went and talked to the Burn Association. It was like, oh gosh, the Burn Association, you know, we never even thought of them. Is, is that something that you know, maybe we could, we could facilitate putting together, it probably wouldn't be more than a couple of slides, but, but I don't know, Neil, is, is, does that seem, you give a lot of these kinds of talks. Can, do you think it's, it's feasible to, to uh, add on a tagline like that? I guess it doesn't hurt if you see it often enough. It would just be nice to have something, even uh, half a page in some of their major journals, um, just something with the patient's component to it as well, because I think that resonates if you were a neurology patient and this is what happened to you. Let's hear from you. Uh, and the patient stories are just so powerful. So, you know, I think it has to be seen in a social context, uh, not just research, not just um, administrative, but really in the full social context. It, and it just might resonate. Not that we haven't been trying for a long time. I presented at epilepsy meetings. I presented at neurology meetings. and. I don't know, I think the attitude is often, I've never seen that. So uh, that's not enough. That's not good enough. Um, maybe that's the title of the whole thing is, I haven't seen that, it's not good enough. Uh, and so th there's opportunities, I think, to, to do that. The caregivers, whether it's dermatology, burn patients, uh, hospitals that have to look after patients like this, uh, they really care a lot. And of course, the patients. Yeah. Well, and, and something that, that we have found to be r relatively useful in our genomic education efforts is to, is to actually try to come up with model cases that are relevant to a subspecialty. So, so you may say you've never seen this, but you certainly have seen patients that come in with a little bit of neuropathic pain, you give them carbamazepine, and then, oh my goodness, they develop this horrible thing and die, you know. Um, so, so those might be, be gripping as well. Um, Mark? Yeah. To uh, add on to what Neil was saying, I think another uh, place where we've occasionally had a little bit broader audience is a, a viewpoint article in JAMA. 
And you know, th this is, I think, again, a really interesting idea that we convened a group to talk about eradicating a terrible disease through the imp implementation of genomic medicine. And I think, you know, having something like that appear in JAMA, you know, that big, big hairy ass deal sort of thing is not a, is not a bad thing. And, and then, you know, make it a call to say, here, you know, here are the people that really need to be engaged in this effort. No, excellent, excellent point. I hope my colleagues are taking notes because I'm, I'm not getting all of, all of these, but, uh, but uh, that's true. Yeah, but I still hope my colleagues are taking notes. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is, uh, but yeah, a call. A call to action that, that was that was you know sort of um, broadly disseminated and, and that and, and published in a in a major journal and and there could well be some interest I mean if we have we have to come up with a, a mess you know a, a synthesized concise message in that uh, particularly if we can in, engage Andrea in, in providing us with with cases you know case stories that, that patients are willing to share of uh, what happened with them. Good. You know the comment was made in our working group too that. Uh, whether you pick polio or measles or some, some other successful thing, uh, one of the rewards of success is the uh, impending failure right after, <laughs> where people would say, well, we don't really see this anymore. We don't really care. And people stop screening and, uh, and you run into stuff. But I mean, that'd be nice. If we're there in 2020, that'll be fine. But still, uh, you still have to be vigilant for it. And I think it's a valuable comment, because uh, I think that is true. No, excellent point. Well, and actually, your, your comment reminded me of, of one of the guidelines I think Dave Veenstra showed from Anthem, um, where, where it was basically, you know, if there are no viable alternative drugs, so we'll pay for this testing if there are no viable alternatives. And yet we heard yesterday that, that essentially what happened, I believe it was in Hong Kong, um, um, was, or maybe it was in Taiwan, uh, that, that basically physicians moved away from carbamazepine into phenytoin, and, and that had as high or maybe even a higher risk in, in that population. And so, so, you know, you kind of wanted to say, Anthem, maybe that's not the thing to have in your, in your guidelines. Um, yeah. Other other points or comments? Right, so I think we we may be able to let you out a little bit early, which I know is going to break everybody's heart. But uh, <laughs> but actually, you know, this may give you an opportunity to develop a few a few other uh, collaborations. Um, my understanding is that you were giving Jennifer all of your cab information, and that you you are all now set for um, um, uh, rides back to the airport uh, or back to the hotel. The ho the shuttle will be here at three o'clock. Yeah, and Jennifer will be organizing the shuttle if you want to check with her on your way out. So, uh, so with that, thanks to Terry and everyone for organizing this meeting. This has been fantastic. And on that note, in addition to a specific thanks to um, Jennifer and Josh, who I think are watching in the overflow room, I also want to thank Deborah for all of the work that she did in organizing this. So thank you, Deborah. Safe, safe travels home, everyone. Thank you again. <laughs>